all doing? Huh? Staying dry? Excellent, welcome to Crash Course Football in America. Woo! Yes! <laughs> My name is Annie Coleman. I'm an Associate Professor of American Studies here at Notre Dame, and I also am the proud director of the interdisciplinary minor called Sport, Media, and Culture, AKA the Smack Minor. Um, <laughs> Professor Catherine Walden is an assistant teaching professor in American Studies and also in the SMAC minor. It's my pleasure to introduce her to you tonight, uh, this afternoon. Um, it does feel like night, though, with being the rain. It yeah. does, yes. And oh, we could do something like this. We one could. Day. We really that could. That would be fun. <laughs> All right. But um, she uh, she's concurrent faculty member in Gender Studies Program, Technology and Digital Studies Program, and the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. So you are getting to meet one of the most accomplished and interdisciplinary people in the College of Arts and Letters and really a role model in terms of cross disciplinary scholarship. Um, she's the heart and soul of the SMAC minor. Um, she's also affiliated with the Initiative on Race and Resilience, um, the SMAC minor, and the Lucy Family Institute for Data and Society. So it's really no accident that Arts and Letters chose Professor Walden to meet with all of you. Um, her own work looks at baseball, labor, and globalization. She uses data analysis, visualization, and interactive digital mapping to illustrate the scale and the scope of minor league baseball labor, as well as the historical forces and labor structures that shape minor league players' working conditions. She's actually actively involved in the Foundry Field Project, which is so cool, you should just look up the website, foundryfield.org, which is a local South Bend public history and community engagement initiative that includes a physical baseball field project, mural wall, and educational programming, and other forms of storytelling around baseball, race, and representation. Today, Professor Walden will speak with you about football, specifically Notre Dame football, and how it has played a central role in defining and understanding America. Awesome. Thank you, Professor Walden. Thank you so much, Annie. All right. Oh, do you want, Annie, do you want your notebook? You're good. All right, well, welcome everyone. Let's see, the first test. The clicker did not pass. Great. <laughs> All right, if folks would like an access copy of the slides, I'll give folks a second to grab the QR code or the short link. I want to thank my colleague Annie for that intro. I also want to thank a number of people in the College of Arts and Letters. If I, I feel like this is an Oscar speech. If I start naming names, I'm inevitably going to forget someone, and the music will start playing. Um, but the coordinator for this event series, Associate Dean Michael Schreffler, the people who do web content, Matthew, John, Heidi, the folks that do communications and operations, Mary and Joss, among many names that I'm forgetting. Also, all the people who put up the signs. As I was walking across campus yesterday, I'm like, there are so many signs. And clearly, the signs worked. So thank you to the people who put up the signs. I also want to thank our folks from Notre Dame Studios who are helping with AV and recording this. And I also want to thank all of you for being here. So I figured, um, just by way of strategy, the key to a good football team is defense. So we're going to start with defense. Then we'll go to offense. And if we have extra time, we'll work on punting. I assume you all brought your own pads. <laughs> OK, it would seem you did not, so we should probably do something else. All right, football joke out of the way. So one of my opening questions when I was thinking about the first time I would teach this football course at Notre Dame is, what does Notre Dame football mean? And who gets to decide? So I actually want to pose that question to all of you. So let's take a minute. You're welcome to think. You can talk to the people around you. They're there are no right answers. There might be some wrong answers, but this is a safe learning space. So talk to your neighbors. What does Notre Dame football mean? Who gets to decide? All right, we could keep talking about this for the next 55 minutes, and that would be a fascinating conversation. But I want to bring us back together. I do have chalk, but I also don't know that I'll write everything on the chalkboard, because that feels slightly disruptive. And this is a big room and a small chalkboard. But I'm excited to hear from some of you, the conversations you were having. So if folks want to um, just raise a hand and maybe share where you're coming from, what does Notre Dame football mean? And who gets to decide? This is where we always wait for the brave student who is excited to talk in the group. Thank you, sir. Your name and where you're coming from. John Lars, Sliding Hands. Awesome. Welcome. Notre Dame football means tradition. Tradition. And anyone can decide. 
Great. So Don from Kansas, tradition. Anyone can decide. We're going to go in the back. Uh, Mark Huffman, class of 85, living in Orlando now. Okay. Uh, it's a brand. Yeah, brand. It gets to decide. I assume the board of directors. And the <laughs> <laughs> but, how that brand is put out there to the rest of the world yeah. to promote and bring all the other things to one another. Yeah, okay, so Mark, who is now from Florida, class of 85, a brand, um, and then thinking about the different people who make decisions about what that brand is. All right, I saw a hand back in the back with a blue shirt, and then we'll come down to you. My name is Gene. No booze, please. Miami, proud Miami University graduate. <laughs> wow. Notre Dame always meant and always will mean, regardless of who you are and whether you have an affiliation with the program or not, it means tradition and honoring the tradition across all levels and across all backgrounds, whatever it may be. Fascinating. Thank you. Who I am? Hi, Jean Collier, uh, Stratford, Connecticut, class of 83. Uh, for me, my sisters would be class of 87. Uh, we're two of 10. And our dad was World War II Marine. So for, for me, not for her, it, it means family. Mm -hmm. And I think who gets to decide? I think the fan and the individual gets to decide. Yeah. Lots of different ideas. And again, I would love to spend the next hour hearing from all of you, but we had kind of tradition connecting to a national identity, but also things that are really local, the places that we call home, the people who make home. So when I was in the summer of 2021 trying to think through what this class would look like, these were the questions that were really on my mind. So part of what my understanding of this lecture series is supposed to do is take you into the Notre Dame classroom. We're in a classroom, that makes sense. So on the first day of the Football in America class, students have watched a really fascinating 1982 documentary, Wake Up the Echoes, the pirated version is on YouTube. If folks involved with the production are in the room, I did not say that. Um, so we're gonna watch the start of the clip and the AV is gonna cooperate seamlessly. Maybe. Time in its passage changes all things. One place, however, has sustained the spirit and the tradition for so long that its story has evolved into legend. <laughs> Each part of its soft bed in the air. The glory of yesteryear meets the challenge of today. So we're in the basement of Gettys Hall right now, and these were some of the things that Notre Dame students in the class came up with as we kind of engaged with that documentary and answered the same questions that you all just did. Um, you're also seeing Professor Walden's chicken scratching that I call handwriting. So themes about kind of its performance, its athletics, its very, a very elite level of performance. It's also a platform. I think uh, Mark mentioned brand, thinking about that piece of it. They were thinking about the history, thinking about what Notre Dame represents, past, present, and future. And then we brought out more different colors of dry erase markers. It was a very exciting day for Professor Walden. Family, tradition. There were, I feel like there should have been more dollar signs, but there was at least one dollar sign. And folks can imagine that Notre Dame students were thinking through what does it look like or mean to be a Notre Dame fan, and then how does that shape all of these other things? I also, one of my highlights, the Notre Dame versus the world, um, which was a fun one. I'm like, I'm just gonna write that down and then we'll have a lot to talk about. Um, so these are some of the things that we start the semester thinking about. So when I was imagining that I was gonna teach this class, I've taught it at other institutions, and we think about college football, the NFL, kind of the large scale questions. When I got to Notre Dame um, four plus years ago and was bringing the class here, one of my mentors was very smart and said, you can't teach that class at Notre Dame and not talk about Notre Dame football, which I'm like, darn it, he was right. Um, but as someone who didn't go to Notre Dame, who was new to the community, was very intimidated by the history. So professors, being professional nerds, the first thing I did is assigned myself a bunch of reading. So we started with books that have been written about Notre Dame. There are just a few. And then we started thinking about Catholic higher education, 
Again, just a few books, light reading. It was a fun summer, and I'm not joking, it was a really wonderful summer. Then we started thinking about the books that sport historians, sport sociologists, others have written about what football means in American culture. Again, just a few. Then we started thinking about, okay, this is just too much. So midsummer, Professor Walden was like, let's think about the books that are about Notre Dame football. Somehow, that did not help us narrow things down. <laughs> just the slide, we're just gonna keep going. I will also say, some of you in the room may have written books that are not on the slides. That's my bad. Um, the entire performance art piece could just be me going through slide decks of books written about Notre Dame football. But let's not forget, there are things other than books. So there are multiple films, documentaries, not one but two Broadway musicals. Rudy had a one-man show on Broadway. Uh, there's a new documentary with an con NBC contract. And then I always feel like I have to mention the off-Broadway biopic musical about Newt Rockney that was produced at Northwestern a few years ago. <sighs> Then there's also physical spaces on campus. So at this point, my brain was just starting to get very overwhelmed. There are statues. We could think about the built environment, about material culture, about visual culture. It's also Notre Dame football is not just in the past. So it's the present. It's evolving. And then there is the thing that I would imagine many of you all are on campus to do, which is the game day experience. <laughs> so that was a lot. <laughs> So I was kind of letting that sit in my brain and being in the Department of American Studies, whenever we can make a Taylor Swift reference, we do. So I had to stop and make a course poster. <laughs> and then I thought about where the course was going to be in the College of Arts and Letters and what kind of students were coming to it. So my colleague, Annie Coleman, mentioned that the course is in the Department of American Studies. It's a great win for us. It's also connected to the sport, media, and culture minor. And then another piece of the work I do at Notre Dame connects to the College of Arts and Letters, Technology, and Digital Studies programs. So thinking about if those are the places where the course is connected, how can we start to make sense of the thousands and thousands of pages that have been written? And again, it came back to the questions that I began with today. So as I was kind of thinking through all the things that I had read, but also a few years of being at Notre Dame, I was also thinking about things that might provoke really interesting conversations, the things that kept me up at night, quite honestly, trying to make sense of what Notre Dame football means. Um, as my colleague Annie Coleman mentioned, my core area of research looks at baseball and American culture. So thinking through, what do photos like this tell us when we've got Newt Rockney, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, and then their collective agent, Christy Walsh, all in a photo together before the USC game. This is one of my favorite things to talk about and think about after the assassination attempt on President Ronald Reagan. His first public event was here at Notre Dame. Um, some of you may have been here for that. Um, thank you, Notre Dame Magazine, for reprinting those remarks. And this is a quote that just lives rent-free in my head. And I'll give folks a second to read it. I'll read it out, too. So this is President Reagan, commencement, 1981. During my growing up years in nearby Illinois, I was greatly influenced by a sports legend so national in scope and so almost mystical. It is difficult to explain to any who did not live in those times. The legend was based on the combination of three elements, a game, football, a university, Notre Dame, a man, Newt Rockney. There has been nothing like it before or since. So as you all were talking about those traditions, um, the legends, but also thinking about how can we understand the way that Notre Dame football has taken shape at different moments in time, and how do we hold kind of the legends loosely, but also ask really big questions about maybe the harder parts of what Notre Dame football means, and these questions of who gets to make meaning. In American studies, we think a lot about myths and symbols and the narratives that we kind of inherit about ourselves, about our country, or about our community. How do we put those in historical, cultural, social, political context? It seemed like a really good place to do that for this class would be to use Notre Dame football as that kind of object of study. So how do you teach a football class at Notre Dame? Still learning, but we landed on a description for the course. This is similar to the description for this talk. So great, football is popular, yes. It also has a long history. Notre Dame 
plays important parts of that history. There are stories that many people know, as you all said, whether or not you went to Notre Dame. But we're also thinking about what happens if we put Notre Dame football at the center and ask these questions about identity, about community, about race and ethnicity, about religious practice, about gender, masculinity, so many different things. And then I j I've been joking with a few folks this semester, back to Taylor Swift, I feel like I'm in my methods era, my research methods era, which I'm not mad about that. So how, as a class, are we gonna think about what Notre Dame football means. So this course tends to have a lot of juniors and seniors, so students that are kind of more further along in their curriculum are equipped to do research projects. So we're thinking about what kinds of research skills and research processes can we use to think about Notre Dame football in different ways. And I got at least one colleague from the Hesburg Libraries in the room, so we were thinking about part of how we tell the history is through sources. Um, so thinking about the rich body of sources that are here at the university about Notre Dame football history, and then how can we use different kinds of tools and methods to tell those stories. More on that. So from all the books, we landed on a few core texts that we're gonna anger the class. And I'm happy, I think we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A to come back and talk more about any of this. But Murray Sperber, fellow Hoosier, wrote a book about the Newt Rockne era, and I'm fairly certain he read, if not every, nearly every letter that Newt Rockne wrote. Um, Black Domers, which I just should make a pitch, needs to be required reading for every person on this campus. I would highly encourage folks to read the book, listen to the stories. Um, one of my colleagues in the Center for Social Concerns kind of has the phrase that justice starts with seeing, um, and there's a lot to see and grapple with here. Then. Folks who know your Notre Dame football history might recognize names Michael Oriard and Alan Sack. A few folks often ask me, what would this course look like at a different institution? Could you do this at various schools and other places that are very less than Notre Dame? Could you put their football program at the center? And I'm like, I mean, maybe you could, but this is one of the moments where I think Notre Dame really is exceptional. So Michael Sack and Alan, or My Michael Oriard and Alan Sack played under Era Persegian. Um, they also went on to get PhDs. Alan Sack was involved in early collegiate labor organizing. Michael Oriard had an NFL career and then went on to be an English professor, which I'm like, great, cool. They have written not, I'm not exaggerating, dozens of books on kind of football and American culture and football history. So how cool is it that we get to read top flight scholarship written by people who were students on this campus and played Notre Dame football? That's really, truly exceptional, and I'm so grateful for their work. So some of that work is historical, but especially bold over and counterfeit amateurs. The forward for counterfeit Air amateurs was written by Era Parsegian. Um, they talk kind of autobiographically about their experience on the campus. Campus. So texts that walked us through the history, but also really resonate deeply for students. And because it's American studies, we have to have different kinds of cultural texts. So we watch Rudy for class. It's a great time. Um, so some of the things that we think about, I tend to organize my courses around questions. And there is so much that we could cover. I joke that you could take Notre Dame football history, and it would be a four-year curriculum. I could teach the course every semester, and it would be different every time, which is overwhelming but also exciting. I also, as I've learned more about the history, really think it's important to understand where Notre Dame football started. Um, a lot of kind of the ideas and the traditions and the ways we put American, Notre Dame football in American culture start in this early era. I may also have a slight obsession with Newt Rockne. He's a weird dude, it's a fun time. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how does football take shape at Notre Dame? What's going on in those early years around the Rockne era? We do not do justice to many different things, but then we also pivot and think a lot about what's happening at Notre Dame and college campuses and in sport during the 1960s as we have cultural movements, but also organizing movements again here and nationally, and then themes that should be no surprise to anyone who's following college football, the questions of the NCAA model, of amateurism, the business piece of it, and how do we make sense of all of that? The other thing that's quite lovely is we get to be out on campus experiencing different ways that football is part of the campus kind of landscape. We do a football tour, it's a great time. Um, we also go to the Rockney Memorial, which some students don't know you can actually go in, but you can. Um, we also get to think about, there was a talk earlier today on football helmets, so I feel like I had to put a slide about football helmets in there, thinking a little bit behind the scenes, but also one of the things that I think is really important for me, back to some themes that you all raised, is 
you know, Notre Dame football can feel like this larger than life thing, but it's made up of people. It's the people who play it, the people who coach it, the people who maintain facilities, the people who polish helmets, the people who do all of this work that makes kind of the spectacle and the experience happen. So trying to create a space where we can think about that too. It's also really important that we think about how it's changed over time. So this is my shameless plug. One of our wonderful colleagues, um, Notre Dame sports archivist, yes, that's a job, has an exhibit on the 100th anniversary of this photo and the four horsemen. After this talk, walk straight to Hesburgh Libraries, first floor on the west side, and learn all about um, this team, this moment in Notre Dame history, this moment in college football history, and a really fascinating story. So we get to work with colleagues like that to learn more about the primary sources. We also use case studies um, to think about, at particular moments in time, what is happening with how meaning is being made around Notre Dame football. And my American Studies colleagues might be chuckling. Initially, I was thinking about making my whole talk about I am not joking, the film that Notre Dame went to court to try to censor. Um, but then I was told that the College Advisory Council might be in the room, and that did not seem like a wise course of action for me. So um, I will just do a very kind of high-level teaser. There was a film. It is 90 minutes of your life that you will never get back, but it is also 90 minutes of your life that you will never forget. Um, Happy to talk more about that in the Q&A, but a fascinating case study. The other thing that I love to do is because we're teaching the course in the fall, we get to experience the season together. Um, so every Tuesday morning, we come into kind of our class meeting after the weekend, and I, I do a segment I loosely title Notre Dame Football News of the Week. And so folks who were following last season um, might remember this moment. And as I, it's one of those things, whenever I'm teaching the class, I have to set up my cable subscription, be following the football season so that I can actually credibly teach the course or talk with students. And when this moment happened, the, co the coverage and the conversation around Notre Dame quarterback Sam Hartman standing outside the medical tent while current Notre Dame quarterback Riley Leonard was inside being treated for an ankle injury. This is a fascinating quote. And again, being able to pull in things that are happening in real time, things that students are thinking about, and put those in conversation with the things that we're thinking about in class. I'll just go back and forth for those really quickly, thinking about the way that this moment was being talked about um, as a kind of celebration of sportsmanship, especially that last quote, when you need to remember what is noble and good about college football that has nothing to do with money. Look at this. Interesting moments that we get to bring in. Also recognizing, again, the national landscape for college athletics and college football is in flux and changing. And Notre Dame is quite literally in the room where those conversations are happening. So it's both challenging as a person who really likes to have a solid lesson plan to have to change it on a regular basis. The first time I was teaching the course was um, fall 2021. And the great news is nothing remotely interesting happened with Notre Dame football that season. I very specifically remember the Tuesday morning in November when I came in and I'm like, I don't know what we're gonna do, but we're gonna talk through it and we're gonna try to make sense of what's going on. Um, so it's just a really rich thing to be able to have smart conversations about Notre Dame football as the season is unfolding. One of the, my favorite things that we've done in cooperation with the Sport Media and Culture Minor is last year around the Tennessee State game, we were able to bring in Mario Morris, who used to be kind of a, an athletics director at Notre Dame, is now in the NCAA central figure planning that event. And again, who are the people who make Notre Dame football? How can we hear from them and listen to them and respect the tradition, but also be able to think about it in more complex and interesting ways? I joke that I'm in my research methods era, but given where the course sits in the curriculum, part of what we're also thinking about is how can we use new kinds of digital tools to analyze sources and communicate knowledge in new kinds of ways. So the lens that we do that, and I promise I'm not gonna throw a ton of jargon at you, there's not gonna be a quiz on this, but given that we're talking about change over time and we're talking about digital technology, digital history is a productive phrase. We think about what kinds of sources are we using, but then what are the ways in which we can use them? Um, and again, I'm happy to talk to folks more about this. We'll have a little bit of time for kind of conversations and questions. But we think about, again, how do we understand the sources? 
and the ways that the sources are preserved and described, how people access them, what happens when we explore those sources using different kinds of digital tools and methods, and then to that last bullet point, how can we share that work with broader audiences? I often joke with our sports archivist, uh, Dr. Greg Bond, that not everyone is gonna read the articles and books that we write, shockingly. So how can we use other kinds of tools to tell stories with different kinds of audiences and communities? One of the things that I mentioned, we've got students from all across the campus and the college. This is a word cloud of their major and minors, majors and minors, so again, folks that are thinking about football, thinking about research in so many different interesting ways. So again, not gonna jump into a full lecture mode, but to unpack that term digital history, it's a whole constellation of things. So it's thinking about the things that historians have done for decades and centuries, analyzing sources, thinking about change over time, putting things in historical, cultural, and social context, but it's also thinking about where digital tools fit into that and how do we access information digitally, but also when we analyze sources using digital tools, what can that open up? And the short version is it can open up many, 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 many different things and it also gives us space to share that with a broader audience. So, you know, for some students who come in thinking, we're just gonna spend the whole semester talking about Rudy, this comes a little bit out of left field, to use a baseball metaphor, which feels inappropriate in a football lecture, but we're gonna roll with it. Um, but some of the things we get to do are really exciting and interesting. So we get to say, what happens if you look at the Scholastic Football Reviews and search for the term Fighting Irish to see how Fighting Irish becomes increasingly used and adopted by students who are writing about Notre Dame football as it happens. Will this run again? I'll let it run again. So what we did there is again, work with our university archives, work with other kind of people across campus, and then see what happens when we use computers and digital tools to think about change over time and how language is being used. Um, another one that's a lot of fun is thinking about the conversations that happen around Notre Dame's football's national presence. And so what happens if we take where Notre Dame football is playing, but also potentially where players are coming from, and put that on a map and think about change over time? So what does that tell us about where Notre Dame is playing, how that intersects with a shifting conference landscape, but also who is playing Notre Dame football and where are they coming from? This came out of a student project in the course last fall. Um, so thinking about, again, it's sources that historians and scholars have worked with for a long time, but it's thinking through different kinds of tools to interact with them, and then different ways we can share that with other audiences. Um, I am not gonna do a lecture on network analysis, but the very short version is people are connected to people, okay? And we can map and diagram those relationships. So we do a little bit with network analysis using Newt Rockney's coaching tree. So we come up with kind of structured data about who coached or played under Newt Rockney and then went on to coach, the institutions that they were at, how long they were in different kinds of positions, and then we use a tool called network analysis to think about the kinds of relationships, the kinds of connections. So the TLDR here is if you wanted mathematical proof that Newt Rockney is the center of the universe, there it is. <laughs> but we're also thinking about how we share that work with a broader audience. So this is a project that we started working on last fall that I'm excited to keep working on when I teach the class again. Many of you, if you've been to the Notre Dame football stadium concourse, after the 2017 renovations, they've got these large hanging reproductions of covers of Notre Dame football game programs. So Professor Walden, 18 months ago, 20 months ago had the idea well, what if we actually unpacked what programs those were? Because um, I just wasn't finding even a list online of what programs were hanging in the stadium. So we were able to work with a few different partners that I want to thank very, very much um, to think about what if we identified the programs that are hanging in the concourse and thought through how do we put them on a timeline, but also how do we put them in a map um, this is not quite ready for prime time. I was really hoping that we'd be able to like roll it out today, but we're not quite there yet, so um, stay tuned. But thinking about ways that we could describe sources and help folks interact with them in different kinds of ways. So it's gonna take us a little bit longer to get it ready for prime time, um, but I will encourage everyone, the programs as you move around the stadium tomorrow afternoon, 
They are all covers of Notre Dame football game programs, and this is your one maybe Easter egg, including one that didn't actually get played. So I'll say that again. There is a cover for a game program for a game that did not happen. I'll leave you with that teaser, and we can come back to it in the Q&A. Um, so some of the cool things that happen if you teach a course on football at Notre Dame, people are very interested in it. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to Notre Dame Magazine and one of their stu former student interns, Christopher Parker. As I told the football class after this was published, I have never been cool in my life. This is a great moment for me. Um, junior high Katie would be very proud. Um, my colleague in the sport media and culture minor and I, Chris Becker, got to go to Vegas on a work trip, which is a sentence I feel very strange saying. But when the Shamrock Series game was held in Vegas, we got to go and give a talk about Shamrock Series uniforms. Um, so exciting that there are other people that are interested in thinking about Notre Dame football in some of the ways that I am, we are, and others are at this institution. So we started at the first day of the semester for football in America. We're going to jump 16 weeks and go to the last day of class. So after we've spent 16 weeks reading about the history, watching a season unfold in real time, thinking through these questions of meaning, identity, representation. I like to take kind of what I call the professor purview and use the last few minutes of class to give a charge to the students. And we come back to these questions that frame our whole semester. What does Notre Dame football mean and who gets to decide? So I'll tell you the same thing that I tell Notre Dame students on our last day of class. Notre Dame football can mean many different things. And this is a quote um, that I really love from um, Tim Oak O'Connor over in Fighting Irish Media. Things that aren't actually traditions that are just the way we do them. And I really find that a fascinating quote because there's so much of Notre Dame football that is bound up in the traditions and those traditions are real. I think we've got Margaret Fosmo from Notre Dame Magazine in the house who wrote a whole article on traditions for the magazine. You should go read it, it's fabulous. Um, so how do we recognize that there are stories that are larger than life? Um, when I started preparing to teach this class, I was slightly overwhelmed, because uh, again, there's no universe in which we cover it all. Um, cover it all in terms of the time period, the people, the events, the happenings, uh, but also overwhelming in terms of there's so many different things for us to talk about when we put Notre Dame football at the center. So we, we try to talk about some of them, um, but I tell students, and I'll tell you all, that you know, if Notre Dame football has never just meant one thing, if it's always meant multiple things, and it's always been the product of kind of negotiated meanings from the people who play it, the people who coach it, the people who write about it, the people who come to campus for games, the people who are part of the Notre Dame community in different ways, that actually makes me incredibly excited because that means we get to keep talking about it and keep thinking about it and making new kinds of meaning so that we can have versions of Notre Dame football and visions of Notre Dame football that respect the history, acknowledge the history, but are also thinking about what it looks like to steward that responsibly and have a way of talking about Notre Dame football history that creates space for many, many, many different kinds of stories. So welcome to Football in America. Thank you all so much for being here. <laughs> All right, so unlike in my actual Notre Dame classes, I did a great job with clock management today. So we've got lots of time for questions. If there are things that you all wanted to know more about, please do not grill me on Notre Dame football trivia. I will fail utterly, um, but I will do my best and thank you all for being here. So if you need to run or do other things, I know it's a game day weekend, but we've got 25 minutes for folks to talk and ask questions and have conversations. Bring it on. <laughs> all right, we're gonna start here and then go to the back. Can you tell me name and maybe where you're from? Yeah, my name's uh, Chris Tracking, I'm from Austin, Texas, Hi. Uh, class of 2017. You've probably studied Notre Dame football more than just about anyone mm. just seeing your talk. <coughs> and then kind of what, what do you think it maybe Maybe in like recent memory, what's the most culturally significant Notre Dame football moment? Do you think oh, that has kind of wow. summarized your yeah. point here today? It's a really good question. And I'm not dodging it. I'll say what it is for me. 
but I also think it's important to recognize that culturally significant could mean really different things to really different people. So for students, it might be, oh, I don't know, rushing the field after the Clemson win or things that have happened in recent years. Um, I would say, actually, this is a moment that I was not here for. Um, but I use this image as kind of the landing image in my syllabus and on our course website. Um, I feel like I just want to stare at it for hours because um, I think it's a complicated image. There's a different one where um, a certain head football coach who shall not be named is kneeling with a raised fist with the team. But thinking about kind of that iconic image of the dome in the background and all the photos that have used that in the background and what does it mean at this particular moment in American history for this to be happening at Notre Dame and folks like Brian Kelly and Father John Jenkins and others to be present. And again, I'm gonna give a shout out to Notre Dame Magazine and others that did really important work covering this as it was happening. Um, I think this is something that for me, again, I wasn't even here for it. This is the one that really resonates for me because I think it changed the conversation for how we think about what Notre Dame football can mean. And it did that in a very public, very national way. Um, I think it also opened up space to have different kinds of conversations about Marcus Freeman as a head coach and questions of representation. I mentioned the Tennessee State game, the first time in its entire history that Notre Dame played in HBCU. So I think, you know, I am not saying that this solved all the issues that we need to think about and talk about with Notre Dame football, but this is one that I think for me represents a lot of different things, how we think about student athletes and their voices, how we think about student athletes kind of using their platform in different ways. There's a long history and I wasn't planning to talk about this, but how you put kind of student activism in context at Notre Dame, going back to the 60s and 70s. And we have some of it, but we don't have as much of it as you might expect. So just what a paradigm shift it is to have something like this happening. Um, I think this is the one that feels really culturally significant for me. But again, I think the beautiful thing is other people might have a different moment that they're attached to. It might be when Frank Leahy coached and kind of brought more black players onto the squad. It might be in the 1960s, David Krashna, again, back to Black Domers, um, was the first black student body president at Notre Dame, worked hand in hand with Father Hesburgh to provide more opportunities for black students and students of color at Notre Dame. And part of how they did that was by removing the ban on football bowl games and exhibition games to use that revenue to provide financial aid support for increasing numbers of black students. It's fascinating, it's complicated. Um, and I think it's really powerful that everyone could have their own moment and we can talk about what that means to you. So that was my long, very long way of answering your question. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go back and then maybe around. Yes. Mark <coughs> Bloomington, Indiana, class of 78. Um, I think Notre Dame has a history of the ethos of the student athlete. Mm -hmm. I think there's always been an accountability that the athletes are held to. Traditionally, they've stayed for most of their undergraduate career yeah. and most of the attained degrees. How do you think this whole NIL pay mm -hmm. for play may affect that whole process? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, and I also should say, this is off the record. No, no, no. Folks can record, folks can quote. Um, one of the reasons I think that I find this class interesting is we get to have that particular conversation in real time as it's happening. So I don't have a short answer. I don't have a definitive answer, but I think it says a lot when, what are the objections or reactions to student athletes being compensated for their labor? Um, as my colleague Annie Coleman mentioned in the intro, part of my kind of scholarly trajectory is thinking about baseball and labor, is studying minor league baseball. So like who is doing the work? How much money is that work making? What are the material conditions of that work? I think it is fair and honest to say that Notre Dame has done more and better than other institutions in terms of providing robust educational opportunities. I wanna shout out the many folks in athletics in the Gold Program and other places that are thinking about professional development, internship opportunities, the kinds of things that other student athletes at other institutions don't necessarily get access to. Um, but I think it's interesting when folks have kind of a gut reaction of if we start paying players or allowing them access to the money that they are earning, then suddenly it's not going to mean what we thought it means or the whole model is gonna crumble. That gives us some interesting things to talk about. Like what are we holding on to, and what is that vision of what college football is means? Part of what we talk a little bit about in the football class too is, especially when we're talking about the Rockney era, 
George Gipp was expelled from the university. I mean, it, people let him back in because the South Bend boosters were so concerned about what was going to happen. So this idea that Notre Dame's football's past has this kind of pristine, pure vision of amateurism is not factually accurate. Like Newt Rockney's players were doing semi-professional matches in other spaces. So I think it's both, let's critically interrogate the past to think through the model. It's not like we had this one perfect model and then NIL ruined it all. Like, no, the model has been sh changed and adapted and the rules change and the criteria change. And then also the money, the stakes of the profit change too. Um, I mean, again, I'm, I'm of a hardcore union family, so everybody needs a union. We sit at the table, we collectively bargain and we figure it out. Um, but I think we need to have the right voices in the room and I'm starting to see that happen. So it's not just athletic directors from places like Notre Dame that are testifying before Congress. It's actual student athletes. It's folks who are former players who are now doing different kinds of advocacy and lobbying. That actually makes me slightly optimistic that we might come up with a policy or a kind of a way forward that articulates clearly what we want college sport to mean, thinks through what is an equitable way to do it. And those are really hard questions and hard conversations. So I don't have a short answer, but I think trying to synthesize. It's interesting to tell us what that reaction says about how we think about the history, both Notre Dame and college football, and then thinking about who gets to be in the room to make decisions um, and have voice and have power to shape what the future is gonna look like is something that seems really important. Yeah. Other questions that folks have? Yes. Hi, uh, Andrew Jarocki, uh, class of 2020. Uh, I'm just curious, I imagine a lot of these uh, conversations that you mentioned back into potentially very contentious socio-political issues. You flashed images of January 6th, I did. of BLM, of topics that can quickly spin into even ad hominem attacks between students that mirror the current public discourse in the country. Yeah. So my question is, in your experience, are Notre Dame students exceptional in this class? Are they better than the average American adult and American <laughs> college student in their ability to handle contentious issues and discuss it productively and civilly and remain disciplined in their analysis, or not, are they prone to the same problems we're facing? That's a fascinating and really loaded question, and I'm clearly still thinking through it. Um, I mean, I would say, and again, I'm looking at some of my colleagues who are here from the Department of American Studies. My class is not the only class that engages this. We've got classes across the campus that are thinking about really fraught, contested aspects of identity, um, intersectionality, critical race theory, I'll just start using all of the buzzwords. Um, so I think I'm grateful to have a community of colleagues where we can think through together what does it look like to teach this well. And I think part of that is what does it look like to teach it responsibly, but also how do we think about what we want our students to learn. Um, for folks who might, I know we might have some prospective folks in the room, I am not remotely interested in brainwashing your child. If I had that power, I would be leading a cult. Um, but. I think it's important for all of us, just as citizens, to have tools to understand our world. And part of that is looking at history honestly, thinking and hearing and grappling with multiple perspectives, especially those that are not our own. I'm restraining myself from making a Catholic social teaching reference, but we can bring some of that in too. Um, I would say my kind of snarky answer is Notre Dame students are very polite. Um, I think, you know, they, I don't necessarily see them having knockdown, drag out arguments, although I will say sometimes things, the, the hottest kind of conversation we've had has more been around how Notre Dame should approach the transfer portal. So I don't know what that says. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, students are very polite, and as a professor, I appreciate that. I'm also, you know, thinking about our theme for the Notre Dame Forum this year is what do we owe each other? Notre Dame institutionally is trying to create spaces where we can have a dialogue that involves listening, um, that involves thinking, um, that involves maybe using our more rational voices to think about our own perspectives and positionality and where someone else is coming from. That feels like a very healthy human thing to do that would probably be good for our democracy. It's one of the reasons I really like my job is that we get to engage with readings or topics or moments or questions that are hard, part of my job as a teacher is to provide a structure for doing that that promotes deep learning and engagement. But it's also just important for us to sit with it and grapple with it. So I don't know that I have enough of a baseline to say are Notre Dame students exceptional compared to other groups of students. I do think they're very polite, which I appreciate. And I think they're also, given the Catholic mission, 
care about thinking about other people, about what does our world need? What do we need to have people and communities that are healthy and thriving and sustainable? Um, and how, what information do we need? What do we need to know to actually be able to do that? That's a really great place to start this conversation. So a partial answer, partial answer. Others, yeah. Hi, uh, Paul Spielbender, uh, class of 88, I'm from Seattle. Awesome. In your study of football, have you ever explored the question, what makes football so different from all the other sports? Wow. So many more people follow football and are excited about football and the emotions around football are so much more intense than a lot of other things. Yeah. Any idea? I have some ideas. Um, <laughs> It's, I'll answer with an anecdote and then come back around. We're still great on time, we got 15 minutes, this is fantastic. Um, one of the other courses I teach is on baseball and America, it's very confusing. Football in America, baseball and America, I get confused. Um, but I've often thought, because I asked this question to both classes, is football or baseball the national pastime? And why? And obviously it's a self-selecting group of students, but of course everyone who's taking a football class thinks that football is the national pastime. And then everyone who's taking a baseball class thinks that baseball is the national pastime. Um, so I think there's some interesting, like in American studies, we have a concept called American exceptionalism. So the idea that America is unique or special or distinct, and in those unique distinctive things is kind of a superiority. So that's interesting to unpack. I would certainly say both from a revenue perspective, from a viewership perspective, football has far eclipsed baseball for decades now. I think there's interesting connections with militarism, um, with constructions of kind of identity, performances of masculinity. And again, I'm looking at this corner where we had someone earlier today doing a talk on kind of the cultural history of the football helmet. So I think what football represents, especially post-World War II, maps onto things that have broader resonance in American culture, especially as baseball has become increasingly potentially multicultural and global and things like that. There are some really important underlying things around what that means and how we understand our country that we should unpack. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting question. I also hear from students, like part of why baseball is my primary area of focus is it's what we watched in the house when I grew up. Like we were in St. Louis, we went to Cardinals games, we watched Cardinals games. If replace baseball with, with Notre Dame football or an NFL team, those things that connect to home and family are part of how we construct identity and form those really meaningful lifelong attachments. So it's a good question. I think about it a lot. In this vision, I imagine the football class and the baseball class having a debate about which one is the national pastime, but I haven't yet made that happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Time for maybe a couple more questions. Way up in the back, sir. Yes, hi, I'm Michael Bastone, yeah. 92. Okay. Um, I was here when the university looked and was quite different than it is now. Um, I was a philosophy theology major in the College of Arts and Letters. Woo! And my daughter and I, who is a senior intersection of American studies, peace studies, and gender studies. Can we say that we love that? Thank you. <laughs> who is a little late because she's in a meeting talking about these sorts of things right now. Um, we often talk about the differences in our experiences. Me being far left on campus in 92, her being far left on campus in 2024. My question to you is, as a fellow professor, when you thought about this session today, <laughs> not speaking to your normal audience, but speaking to an audience that looks much more like the university looked in 1992 within the room, how did you approach today and try to walk the line between what your class stands for and the audience got in front of you? Oh man, again, another really loaded question, um, which, I, which I appreciate, I appreciate, all right. Um, I'm trying to think through the amount of filtering that I want to do. We can have a separate conversation. Um, I mean, I could have not put some things in the talk that I put in the talk. Um, so I think, you know, folks can take what you'd like to take from that. But as I was thinking through, and I want to give a shout out to colleagues who have listened to me think out loud about this talk a few different times this week. Thank you. Um, I wanted to be explicit about some things, um, but also try to provide a space where folks could engage and we could have constructive conversations, which back to the question earlier, is part of how I think about teaching. Like I have my own kind of commitments and ways of thinking through the world. My job as an educator is not to indoctrinate students, it's to 
have them engage and look at the scholarship of top flight scholars, give them the critical thinking tools to unpack it and interrogate it, and then move that into whatever they are doing out in the world. Um, like my job is not to make them agree with me on everything. I have to tell students all the time, like I'm not asking you to read something because I want you to agree with all of it. I may not agree with all of it. Part of what we read and think through is so that we can grapple with different perspectives. So yeah, again, filtering how honest I wanna be here. So a couple things that I knew would be humorous, a couple things that I knew would be interesting, a few things that might be thought provoking and a little bit challenging, and I was slightly anxious about how the Q&A might go. That's my <laughs> honest answer. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, Chris Toops, class of 2012, okay. uh, from Tampa. Awesome. Uh, in your opinion, where has the university's religious identity impacted the football program the most? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think, you know, you certainly see it in the history of just who was on campus, especially in those early, even pre-Newt Rockne years. Um, of just who was already a student on the campus that would have showed up to play for a game. Um, I mentioned really briefly that question of how Notre Dame became the Fighting Irish. Um, I think there's definitely a place that religious practice fits into that. So thinking about the university shifts from French Catholic to Irish Catholic, and there are others in the room looking at Margaret, Margaret and others who know this history better than I do. Um, but I think by the time you get to the 1920s, 1930s, Notre Dame's kind of campus has changed. The kind of vector of American Catholicism has changed. Um, and so Notre Dame football becomes this thing that in Indiana and around the country is there's pretty violent anti-Catholic sentiment. Again, we're at the 100th anniversary of the Klan rally in South Bend, among other things. Anti-Catholicism was real and quite violent. And Notre Dame football, when you see a team from a Catholic institution beating Ivy League teams, beating other teams from Protestant spaces, that has really rich meanings um, for American Catholics around the country. And again, I've got colleagues that study this could that articulate better than I do. Um, I think it also, I think there's a piece of it that's the history of just how does Notre Dame become a national brand? The religious practice piece in American Catholicism are really, really big parts of that. Why are there people who have never stepped foot on this campus who have incredibly deep, strong ties to the university? Not saying that religious practice is the thing for every single person, but I think it's a really big thing for many people. I would also say, thinking about, again, folks are here for a game day weekend. Um, I remember, I'm trying to remember which Notre Dame football media cycle this was, um, but at some point, Maybe it was, with the, it was either with the hire of Marcus Freeman or it was when Father Jenkins announced he was stepping down. Interesting moments in football in America. Um, but we kind of talked about the reaction that like, oh, Notre Dame needs to bring back game day mass and then they'll win a national championship. Or one of my favorite things of we haven't won a national championship since the stadium was renovated and touchdown Jesus cannot see in. <laughs> Again, some of those are urban legends. But I think it speaks to how folks are thinking about the history, perhaps in kind of funny ways. But also, I mean, we can look at Marcus Freeman, his conversion to Catholicism. We can think about the way that players kind of in their media commentary talk about the role of faith as being grounding. I'm, I'm sure there are other football teams that have chaplains, but you know, I think that piece of it is just very much a part of the history, but also seems like for many people that are actively part of it now, is providing really deep, rich meaning. Is that getting this started? Yeah. Maybe time for one more, since I am doing long-winded answers today, evidently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm Ben Hicks. I'm a freshman from Cincinnati, Ohio. Awesome. Uh, Good to see you again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, similar question. Um, you know, you, you mentioned Notre Dame's unique approach to NIL and transfer portal. So I was wondering, kind of starting with Father Hesburgh's approach to making the university a more like institutional and research kind of elite school in the country. Um, how do you think that approach to still like being a football powerhouse but being one of the greatest schools in the country kind of changed football programs, putting a new place for the team, what other students they play? It's really like what extent has the changing educationally the school affected the football program? This is a really big question. Um, I would say. I think there's a couple layers to it. There's one layer that kind of is university operations. Then there's another layer of like 
national conversations. So again, I'm going to guess we have some Notre Dame football fans in the room. Just guessing, guessing. Um, so the conversation of Notre Dame is struggling to compete at an elite national championship level because of facilities, because of recruiting, because of academic standards. We can keep kind of fleshing out that list. That's an interesting set of things to think about in terms of what is it saying about Notre Dame's institutional identity? What is it saying about the relationship of the university and athletics? And then what does it say like on a high level for the football program? But also, as I remind myself and I remind students, like we say Notre Dame football, but it's people. It's dozens of people who play it, who coach it, who work in many different kinds of ways to make it happen. Um, I feel like I'm losing the thread of your question. I'm gonna try to come back around. So I think you know there are conversations around the current kind of market for head coaches and elite programs and the facilities arms race and where Notre Dame fits in that. Um, I don't know that I have really strong answers on that, but an anecdote that I'll share that is something we talked about in the football class when a certain former head coach who shall not be named um, departed in a very interesting 48 hour news cycle. It was a fun time, I got some sleep. Um, you know, the idea that we had a head football coach who was trying to get upper admin in a meeting for a month and that meeting didn't happen um, is maybe a deep cut, but an interesting moment. So I, I'm really fascinated by kind of how university administration responds or engages, especially, I mean, we can think of it in terms of the kinds of coaching hires. Um, we've seen kind of coaching contract negotiations play out pretty publicly in high profile ways. I have no insider knowledge, but I think it's fascinating to watch. And what does it say about kind of institutional commitment and will to engage at a certain level that purportedly seems necessary to do certain kinds of recruiting? And some of it's bound up in academics, some of it might be bound up in other things, but that's a fascinating mess to disentangle, to think about where we are and where we're going. So with that, I'm happy to stick around. Maybe there's something going on in the room, but thank you all so much for making time. On the count of three, let's go Irish. Go Irish.